So today we're going to, or at least for this video, it's still today for me. Um, we're going to talk a bit about how to even approach this big question of how do we understand the whole person. And essentially, we pick a small chunk. You can call it an approach or a paradigm, but it's a theoretical framework that focuses on some phenomena and kind of ignores others. It's a way to kind of limit what part of personality is examined so that the task of studying personality psychology or being a personality psychologist is just not overwhelming and impossible. So even when trying to understand the same research topic, these approaches approach it, well, differently. For example, a trait psychologist might try and understand whether depression's relationship with neuroticism is uh, stable over time. And if there are specific facets of neuroticism that are more strongly linked than others versus a behavior geneticist who's going to be more interested in understanding if depression and neuroticism share con common genetic sources. And there are different kinds of studies to answer those questions, but they both get at the general topic of how are neuroticism and depression related. And all these pieces combined help tell us a story about the relationship between depression and neuroticism, but you would never want to do all those studies at once just because it would be overwhelming and also incredibly expensive. Doing a longitudinal twin and cousin study, that's a tough sell um, versus just doing a snapshot of twin and cousin study to understand the genetic underpinnings and then doing just a random subset a random selection of people to understand neuroticism over time and follow those people over time more financially feasible and also just manageable. It's way easier to track a thousand people than a thousand people and their cousins and their twins. There are tons of different approaches. I've already kind of hinted at a couple and my uh, tripod is blocking. Okay, there we go. So the trait approach um, is just the most general approach. It's how do people differ psychologically? Are there stable aspects that differ over time? And that's going to be the one we start with. The other frameworks often lean on the trait approach for the most part, except for Freud, but we'll get there. So the biological approach is a little different, but they can still play together. Like I, behavior geneticist, quantitative psychologist and personality psychologist, and they're not, they're not all the same aspects of my academic identity, but they all lean on the same element. So the biological approach, um, its aim is to understand the mind in terms of the body. And this includes anatomy, physiology, genetics, and evolutionary psychology, really anything that's about biology and kind of other natural here, natural sciences. Now the psychoanalytic approach is on the other extreme end, and it's primarily concerned with the unconscious mind and internal mental conflict. And there's more paradigms, so there's not just these three. So the phenomenon the phenomenological approach is, has a focus on people's conscious experience of the world. And you can kind of slice this one up a couple of different ways. Well, the humanistic version of this approach is interested in or how conscious awareness produces uniquely human attributes. Its goal is to kind of understand the meaning and basis of happiness. Positive psychology falls under this bucket. Now, what do I mean by uniquely human attributes? Existential anxiety, creativity, free will, happiness, anything you hear about in a philosophy class. Now, cross-cultural kind of falls under the phenomenon, logical. It's got a home here. Like, each paradigm is has its own unique features. I'm just trying to break them down in a kind of at least a cohesive way. It um, tries to understand how the... Sorry, the, the tripod is literally blocking that line. How the uh, experiences of reality vary across cultures. Sorry. <laughs> I've got to find a good place for this tripod. And it's clearly not here. Um, but I'm going to keep going. 
just because, well, I I want to give give you as many lectures up front as possible. So cross cultural is all about how our experiences of reality vary across cultures. Another basic approach is the learning and cognitive approach. It's how behavior changes as a result of rewards and punishments and other life experiences. So there are a couple of different buckets. Again, these bigger kind of umbrellas have their own approaches within it. Like a classic behaviorism focuses on overt behavior and how those kind of overt behaviors are affected by rewards and punishments. Social learning focuses more on learning through observation and self-evaluation, while the cognitive personality approach focuses on cognitive processes, including perception, memory, and thought. And I like to think of the cognitive psych approach kind of as how the mechanisms of personality are expressed. So there are multiple approaches. They're, they're not competitors. They're not mutually exclusive. They're, they can be complementary. Each, each approach aims to address different questions. And each approach also ignores many other key aspects. So when I say different questions, like psychoanalysis is really good at explaining why someone misplaces their keys, whereas the behavioral approach doesn't. Like the behavior genetic approach is not going to explain why I keep leaving my keys in my like bathroom sink and why I cannot figure out where they are ever, even though they're in the bathroom sink. They just, they don't. <laughs> and so for that approach, you would definitely, for that research, burning question, you would want to go with the psychoanalytic approach, not the behavior genetic approach. Um, yeah. So in terms of, is there a way to integrate all of these? Like essentially, is there one big theory? Um, and no, there's not. Personality psychologists have not found a way to solve the dilemma of, uh, Finding one big theory that covers every aspect of psychology and explains, or personality and explains all the nuances. There are some psychologists who would argue that their approach is the correct approach. Um, and probably the closest one to if you had, if you held, like if you held my cat hostage and insisted that I tell you which, which theory is closest to the one big theory, I would argue the trade approach is. But even the trade approach has its limitations. And often these these approaches kind of work nicely together. Um, it would be great if we could organize all existing theories into one big framework. And I, I don't think it's possible to do because there's so much nuance. But I don't hold the extreme view that there's no point of trying to unite all the theories. It's a lost cause. And that different approaches just address different questions and should be left as. There's probably some nice overarching theory. I tend to view all these different approaches through a trait psychology approach lens and then apply different paradigms to them. But there's debate here. So as of right now, there's not one big theory. There just isn't. It'd be awesome if there was. And if you can find a way to unite all of psychology into one overarching theme, please do, because that would make that would make this whole lecture obsolete. So there are numerous ways to slice up these approaches. Uh, one is kind of trade versus situation. You could kind of break that down by like biopsych, um, trade psych and psychoanalytic versus the social the learning approaches. You could also slice it by a modern versus historic. So essentially Freud, Jung, and Rogers as the kind of historic and the uh, modern is everybody else. So anyone who's PhD who's been developed in the past at least 50 years. The other one is kind of nature versus nurture. You'll hear this one a lot. And it breaks down kind of the biological, physiological, and genetic aspects and contrasts them with cultural, environmental, and experiential. That is another way to slice it, just to kind of give you some ways to organize all of these theories. 
Now I've created a nice diagram here that break down the big ideas. Just the camera's like right in front. I gotta figure something out. But um, besides moving it. So uh, each paradigm has kind of a basic summary of focus that I've provided in this table, along with kind of the big names attached to it. Uh, you won't have to know all these names, but it's helpful because some people will call something like the psychoanalytic approach. Sometimes it's called the Freudian approach. And it's helpful to know what people are talking about. Now, one way that I kind of slice these together is putting the biological and learning approaches as a where does psychology come from? And the psychoanalytic, neoanalytic, and humanistic, they're interesting, but they're more historical than anything. They're not directly relevant to contemporary personality theory and research, but they lay good foundations. And we wouldn't be where we are today without these kind of historic aspects. Now, this is somewhat oversimplified. Uh, like the most oversimplified version is just trait approaches versus cognitive approaches. Now, uh, there are other approaches that kind of fall in here too, like cross-cultural, developmental, positive psychology, as you can see from my lovely little green arrow, bubbly thing, um, and like the cognitive aspect looks at contact. So these, these look at context, but not from the situational cognitive lens. So there is no magic single paradigm that nicely covers all of these, but then if it did, we'd have one big theory and I wouldn't need to give you this table. Cool. So there are some advantages. Oh my goodness, at this. This camera is driving me nuts. Oh, and that's the pineapple of solitude that does not have a cat in it right now. Okay. So um, there are advantages and disadvantages to personality psychology. This applies to every theory. So great strengths are usually also great weaknesses. And Funder says they're often the opposite of the true as well. Funder calls this uh, Funder's first law. It's also seen in individuals. And essentially, the stronger your theory, the better it is at a very specific area. But um, its strength is really focused, and so anything outside that area is less helpful. The goal for personality psychology is to account for the whole person, and uh, those real life concerns, there's a lot of advantages to having this broad goal, it is, it's inclusive, it's really interesting, and it's obviously important, but at the same time, it can be super over-inclusive, and you never know where, to, where do you cut your research paper down, where do you stop? Um, and it can also lead to unfocused research. If you try and cover everything, you're going to have giant books about very specific topics that probably didn't need to get into that much detail. But that's the goal. Now, really every basic approach are really good at certain specific topics. Like behavior genetic approaches are awesome at understanding how behaviors are influenced by genes versus the environment. But they're not so great at making predictions about like, how does um, neuroticism impact later health. Behavior genetics could tell you, well, there seems to be a genetic piece to neuroticism and a genetic piece to health. Maybe they have that in common. Hmm. So it's not so hot at prediction as much as understanding the past. Um, and so that is a disadvantage. And every approach is like this, either really poor, they really poorly address topics outside their area or just ignore them. Like behavior genetics does not talk about the unconscious mind or psychic conflict. We just don't because we can't really use our methods to do it. And so we just don't ask questions about it, which has some downsides. But I think if we tried to, if we we did not do a great job. Hence, we focus on what we do focus on. It's like specialization. So one thing that I really like about personality psychology 
and this is essentially why I'm here, uh, is that it really appreciates how people are different. A lot of other areas of psychology, like social psych in particular, try and treat people all the same. They, they write off those differences of why people behave differently, and they actually put them in the error term. So those are statisticians, the, the one statistician in the audience, and just write it off as noise. But that noise is interesting. It explains why people do, why people differ. I don't really find that much exciting in explaining why people all do the same. Because frankly, if all the people do the same thing, it's not very exciting or surprise or interesting because they see it every day. Now, there are some kind of downsides to this. It's called pigeonholing, and it's a tendency to kind of put people into really specific categories. And that's not always helpful because people can have multiple identities. Their their behave their traits and behaviors can differ over time, but at least they acknowledge those differences. And at the very least, it leads to a sensitivity and respect for individual differences because people differ. If we were all the same, I'd kind of be boring. Anyway, uh, that is it for this uh, short video on paradigms. I will uh, wrap it up and you'll see it online or see it on Canvas pretty soon.